So what does that set us up for here? Now beginning to see the organization of this. By the way, 95% this whole stuff here, I don't know what percentage is accounted for by identified promoters and repressors and stuff, but it's a tiny percentage. What that means is there's regulatory stuff going on that no one has a clue about. The main thing though here is modulatory structure to genes, introns, exons, and this whole world of the environment regulating when genes are turned on and off, a whole world where you can generate completely different proteins, not a protein that's a little bit more this way, a little bit more that way, in completely different contexts. So all we need to do now is begin to stick this into the molecular biology of mutations and evolutionary change. Where does this begin? Let me just see. Oh, no, before we do that, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to look at one more level of regulation here. Okay, so you got your DNA, and we already know this whole business, what's telling it what to do. You can have transcription factors coming in, all of that, these interesting implications. DNA, let's see, for our purposes, is protected in sort of layers of protein that are just sort of structurally stabilizing. This is not really what they look like or quite what they're made of, but they're called chromatin. There's this stuff that stabilizes the DNA because these are wispy little things. And one of the things that, of course, they need to do is they're enwrapped around the DNA stabilizing. You've got some transcription factor coming in from somewhere else in the cell. It's got to be able to get down to the DNA. And thus, you have a whole world of chromatin opening up to allow transcription factors to get through. And thus, you have a whole world of what's telling the chromatin to open up where and when. Suddenly, a whole world of regulation of whether the transcription factors even have access to the DNA. So you can have tons of a transcription factor and all set to transcribe something off of this. And thanks to conformational changes, folding or unfolding of chromatin, you're regulating whether the transcription factor can even get through. And thus, there's a whole world of stuff that changes chromatin modeling and remodeling. Additional step here, one that's really interesting, is you can do things, circumstances arise, the environment can do things, where you change the, the uh, structure of chromatin around a particular gene in a way that makes it easier to transcribe or harder to transcribe, and you can essentially make that change permanent. You could permanently do something in some particular stretch of chromatin so it will never open up again to allow the transcription factor in. And what you have just done, jargon, is you have silenced that gene. You've silenced it permanently. And people know a lot of the mechanisms for how this occurs. For those who care about such things, the process is called methylation. This is a little bit different. That's occurring with the DNA itself. But this is silencing of genes by structural access of transcription factors to it. When does that occur? There's all sorts of circumstances early in life where you will change the permanent accessibility of some gene and transcription factors. You will cause long-term, lifelong changes. As but one example, and one that we will look at a number of times down the pike there, in rats, the mothering style of the mother rat will cause chromatin changes, permanent ones, in some of the genes related to stress hormones. So that certain types of mothering, how often you lick the baby and other rat mother type stuff, will regulate how readily some genes will be turned on for the rest of your life. This is early experience. This is molecular mechanisms for events early in life lasting forever a lot of these turn out to be a little bit reversible, but for our purposes, lasting forever, this is a whole new field called epigenetics. Genetics is all about DNA sequences. Epigenetics is all about regulation of access to DNA sequences, things of that sort. So suddenly, this epigenetic world is entirely capable of overriding anything going on at the transcription factor end. Just to give you a sense of this, 
researcher, this is a guy at National Institutes of Health, a guy named Steve Sumi, who studies primate social behavior. And what he has shown is in monkeys, in one part of their brain, you change the style of mothering that that monkey is subject to as a baby, and you will change the conformational access state of 4,000 different genes enormously influ influential there, enormous arrays of ways of regulating where it's not genetics, it's epigenetics. And this has given rise to a great phrase, fertilization is all about genetics. Development is all about epigenetics. And what epigenetics is about are ways in which the environment not only can regulate what's going on with this gene right now, but can cause lifelong differences in the ability to access genes. So this is an enormous array of levels of regulation, splicing enzymes, determining how your exons get mixed and matched, generating all sorts of different proteins, transcription factors representing the things that turn the switches on and off, and the array of switches is far more interesting and plentiful than the gene itself, transcription factors reflecting what's going on in the outside world, like in the rest of the cell to the other side of the planet, and finally this whole additional level of regulation where some of the regulatory consequences here can be lifelong. Enormous array of levels of regulation.